Hi, my name's Stuart Watkins. I'm the General Manager of Projects at Arafura Resources. We're developing the Nolans Project in the Northern Territory, which is a rare earths project focused on neodymium and praseodymium, which is we tend to call NDPR. It has the capacity to develop and, and produce approximately 4,500 tonnes per annum, which is around 6% of world production. NDPR is a vital metal for making permanent rare earth magnets and with the push towards electrification of transport and wind turbines and modern technology, it is becoming more and more important in this modern economy that we're living in. Yeah, thank you very much. Good introduction. Um, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Merlin. Uh, so, Nolan's Bore. Uh, I know very little about this project. Um, you know, I look at your presentation materials, I look at the company, everything looks fantastically, really good, uh, you know, well presented, very professional. Um, <clears throat> now, I just wondered if you could help me out and just kind of take me back a little bit, um, provide me kind of a bit of background to the project and a bit of history about how you came to it and, you know, where it's come from as a project. Okay, yeah. Um, Nolan's was discovered in uh, the early 2000s, which seems like an awful long time ago, but that's the way of rare earths, I guess. Um, they, they're not quick to develop projects. Um, in, in early 2000, they started drilling there, they developed a resource, and they started a metallurgical test work program. Um, they moved through a couple of different flow sheets, um, and then in 2012, I think it was, they did an extensive drilling program and had a big resource increase. Then they realised that the, the flow sheets that they had probably weren't going to work in, in, the, in the environment, the financial environment at the time. Um, the, the, the operating cost was too high, the, the capital cost was too high, so they really went back to the drawing board. And, and I think that's something that is quite unique about rare earth projects is the, on, sorry, the technology. So sorry. Yeah. So, 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 so just uh, you talked about there that it wasn't going to work at that price environment. Was that because there was a huge rare earth um, price peak, wasn't there? Kind of it spiked around 2011, 2012. And, and as that came off, was that when they realised that, they, that the, the Met wasn't going to work? Yeah, the, 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 they had developed their first flow sheet at that point in time, um, before my time in the company. And when that price spike got up, that was fairly short-lived, um, unlike the prices we're seeing today, which are on a very steady rise. Um, but that was when the Linus project at Mount Weld got up. And uh, you know, prices at those times peaked at sort of $300 a kilo for NDPR oxide. Um, but yeah, so they went back to the drawing board to, to really try and understand how do you make this all work? I mean, every rare earth deposit is fundamentally different in its mineralogy and its chemistry, and unlocking the Rosetta Stone of that is really the key. Um, in about 2015, um, the one, one of the people who works for me here now, uh, Alex Elliott, really unlocked the key to this ore and, and, and developed the phosphoric acid pre-leach process where we actually can use the, the specifics of the ore to actually unlock it and we work with the ore rather than fighting against it. Um, and I, I joined in 2018, about halfway through the piloting, and, and we commenced the definitive feasibility study. I, I see that uh, you did f a four-year metallurgical um, kind of pilot program. Was it, did you join in the middle of that? or have you, have you, uh, I, I joined roughly in the middle of that in, in the beginning of 2018, um, just before we kicked off the definitive feasibility study. I came in to run that for the company. Um, and we, during the feasibility study and just a little bit beyond, we finished off the metallurgical piloting program and uh, that really underpins the, the confidence we have in our flow sheet. Um, I, I always get a, a smile when I hear kind of definitive or the full final feasibility study because it's almost as if the feasibility studies before that weren't really feasibility studies and, you know, is this the final ultimate you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, Us engineers uh, like to talk about that sort of stuff, you know. But, 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 but realistically, what what all a definitive feasibility study means is we we are costing what we're actually going to build, you know, rather than sort of that'll kind of work and we'll we'll give it a go from there, which is what you tend to have for a pre feasibility study. Um, can we just step away from Nolan Spore at the moment? Just mm -hmm. kind of, um, can you bring me up to speed on? Um, rare earth separation and kind of um, oxide production of NDPR oxides kind of around the world, because 
when I last had a kind of an in-depth look at this sector, um, the processing technology was kind of run and controlled by China and that there, there, were, there was no rare earth production outside of China. Um, I, I just wondered, has that changed? In kind of, what's the story now? Look, rare earth, um, I, I believe it used to, back in the dark distant days, be, be uh, more produced in, in the US and uh, in Europe. But certainly, um, you know, through the 80s, I believe it was primarily, you know, rare earth production really became centred in China. Um, there was a number of uh, French companies working in it, but eventually all their production facilities moved to China. There was large... Um, large uh, deposits there and so they work with that and and eventually as you as you said prior to that boom in 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 the early 90s um you know there, there really there really was no production outside of outside of china um and and then when linus came on board in 2011 i uh, believe it was they they really were the first and and still are largely the only integrated uh, producer outside of China through to separated rare earth oxides. And I think it's really good that you you tweaked on to the separated rare earth oxides part of it because unless you're producing a separated rare earth oxide, if you're producing a concentrate or if you're producing a even a mixed rare earth carbonate, you still have to sell it to China to yeah. separate for you. Um, and, and that was a big part of um, what we did at Arafura. The, the decision was made to, to build, like Linus have done, a, a value chain outside of China's Made in China 2025 strategy. You know, um, so, so we always committed to going through to separated rare earth oxides and, and adding as much value as, as we could. I guess the, the upside of that is that means that all our waste management is all contained on one site. You know, our, um, you know, something about rare earths that always come with a bit of radioactivity. There's, it's, it's like copper and gold go together. There's no getting away from that. Um, so being able to manage all that waste on one site, I mean, we're talking about a chemical process here, makes means that we tick all the green boxes for, you know, vehicle producers out of Europe, um, and for the US markets as well, you know, so that that's a really important part of it for for us at, at Arafura. So, let, let, just looking at Noland Bore, it's um, it's got a kind of a, a predictable mineral suite. Now that you've done the mm -hmm. the work on it, you can see that it's got apatite and monazite and um, alanite, which are two phosphate minerals and a and a silica, silica. mineral. Yeah. Um, You've also got a um, what's what's the you, you've got a, f um, a phosphate percentage in the ore, kind of thirteen percent is P two O five, yep, and you've got um, two point nine percent total rare earths. So, is the phosphate in the appetite, and is it in the monazite? Is 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 that where the phosphate's kind of presenting itself? That that was the, the rare earths. Our, our predominant rare earth mineral in in the ore body is the apatite. Um, the monazites tend to occur as micro inclusions within that. And then when you get the higher metamorphic grades, and and I know you're a geologist, so please don't pick on me if I get all this wrong. Um, when you get the higher metamorphic grades towards the edge of the ore body where there's been some alteration, is where you get the alanite. Um, really, and and that was the key to understanding this ore body was realising, unlike our, um, our, our other rare earth deposits, we can't produce a high-grade rare earth concentrate from beneficiation. We can, we can produce a high-grade phosphate concentrate, but then we have to go the chemical route to, um, to, to actually unlock the rare earths from there. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where the phosphoric acid preleach process really came into the fore because by using that process, which we, we developed in-house and we have patents on, um, it allows us to uh, leach the phosphate out of the ore, separate the rare earths before we actually regenerate the phosphoric acid, uh, regenerate the phosphoric acid after the rare earths have been removed and that recycles back around to leach more phosphate ore and then take the bleed of that which is our excess phosphate, and produce a, a merchant-grade phosphoric acid product, which, which really gives us a fantastic byproduct credit. I think it's about, you know, at the DFS and, and our project update prices, it's around 13 or 14% of our revenue comes from phosphoric acid export. Could you um, 
pull up a, sp- a flow sheet because my when it when it, when it comes to um, following, uh, I'm not an engineer, uh, and please don't pick right. on me for that. Uh, um, that's all right. I would never do that. Let me pop up a flow sheet for you. There we go. Okay, so, so the, the, the all comes so, in the front end. Yeah. So and, the front end of the process is a really really simple single stage flotation to produce a high phosphate concentrate. That 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 actually is tiny. We then take that concentrate, we leach it in. Sorry, uh, sorry quick question. Is and it's a coarse grind. Is it soft rock? Very is coarse it hard grind. rock. It's 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 medium. It's not very hard. It's 150 micron grind. Um, it's a very simple sort of um, very simple flotation. As I said, it's it's open circuit roughing flotation only. So that okay. that really gives us um, the a simplest flotation plant you can get. Yeah. Um, I say as a man who's designed a few. Um, so we, we then leach that concentrate in phosphoric acid um, under control conditions, getting the temperature right to keep various things in solution and keep various things out of solution. We then separate after that, we take this, we take the solids and then we heat the heat it up. And then we take the solids that precipitate out of from heating it up. And that takes all our rare earths through to the bake. We then regenerate the phosphoric acid with um, sulfuric acid to produce our phosphoric acid for leaching, but also an excess phos acid, which we clean up for um, impurities, take away some water, and then ship out to Darwin, and then over Sorry. most likely to India. That um, that acid plant kind of icon there is that to, is that generating sulfuric acid and then reprocessing phosphoric? So it's a kind of a twin. No, acid no, plant. that's. That's just our graphic designers being lazy and not knowing what an evaporator looks like. Okay, so it's not yeah. that's, a, that's an icon. Not, for an we, we do have an acid plant, but okay. that's kind of just a, an arrow. Um, so after we after we have the um, the leached residue, we then bake that um, using sulfuric acid. Now this is where our process starts to get really really different. We don't need to actually run our bake at 700 degrees like many of the other players in the market um, because they're actually trying to boil off the excess sulfuric acid, whereas we don't mind if that excess sulfuric acid stays there because after we, after we do water leaching and put everything into solution, we then take the liquor from that, which has got a rare earth sulfate, and we put it through the second part of our process that is key to this, um, which we have a patent on where we add a, a, a chemical to it an everyday chemical, to be honest, and that causes the rare earth sulfate to precipitate out without actually neutralising any of the acid. Hang on, sorry. Um, forgive my poor understanding of, of um, metallurgy or hydrometallurgy. And um, yep. so, when you talk about an acid bake, it's you're, you're heating. It, it's it's more like a kind of an acid boil, really. It's it's a saucepan uh, yeah. equivalent. You're not. You're not I, uh, it's, 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 it's you're heating the yes. fluid up, not heating. A no. So, cake so what up. you do is you mix for every ton of residue we have, we mix 1.6 tons of sulfuric concentrated sulfuric acid with it, and that yeah. forms a paste. And then we heat that up. In our case, 250 degrees. Okay. Yeah. In Linus's case, they they have an acid bake, but they they mix this paste and then they heat that paste up to 700 degrees and produce a dry. Uh, discharge from their kiln. So they have great big long, you know, 200, 300 metre long kilns. We we do all this in a paddle dryer. Okay. Thank you. Just, so just, we, we just leave it the... as a paste. Okay. So you leave it as a paste and then you re-liquefy it in the water leach phase. You, you drop it in water and that's about all you do. And okay. then separate and then, the solids and liquids. So the solids and liquids. So the solids go to the tails and no, the liquid... the, the, yeah, the solids go to the tails and the liquor comes to precipitation. Okay. And so and in the precipitation, you chuck in your everyday chemical, which is your um is that a is that a um proprietary secret what that chemical is? I could okay. tell you, but you uh, but you'd you'd have to kill me. <laughs> I'd, um, I'd have to kill you, yeah. Yeah, well, there we go. Like that's a good thing to do. Um yeah. So, uh, so once we precipitated out the rare earth sulfate, we separate the solids and the liquids. And this mixed acid, which is the liquor phase, now contains about 10% phosphoric acid from the phosphates in the, in, the, in, the, in the leftover in the material. 
and about 20% excess sulfuric acid. And that goes back in to regenerate our phosphoric acid in the pre-leach. So yeah. all of the excess acid we add into the bake ends up leaching appetite and making phosphoric acid byproduct. So that's yeah. why our operating costs can be so low. So the, the, the appetite provides you with both the rare earths and the phosphorus. And the phosphorus. And the phosphorus goes to one product and the rare earths goes elsewhere. Okay. And then we, you've got three, three stages, which is we then, sulfate to hydroxides to chloride. Yes. Yeah, so we basically precipitate out the rare earths as a hydroxide, purify that using magnesia um, and uh, a few other little minor chemicals. That's mainly to remove some of the impurities in there. We then leach the um, from the rare earth hydroxide using hydrochloric acid. We do a differential leach where we leach out all of the lanthanum, near NDPR, um, heavy rare earths, and we leave behind the cerium hydroxide. Um, and that, that means we don't have to carry all of that cerium, which is by far the biggest mass of rare earths, into the um, solvent extraction circuit. We do purify the cerium, but mainly to recover any lost NDPR from it because the cerium is not worth a lot. And with NDPR production growing worldwide, um, you know, there's, there's a good chance that price is not going up anytime soon. We can produce it later if we want to. We then take that rare earth chloride, evaporate off some of the water, and then put it through a um, small, very small um, SX circuit for removing the SEG, um, samarium, europium, gadolinium, and heavy rare earths. Um, and then following that, it goes through to another uh, solvent extraction circuit that then removes the NDPR, which we can then precipitate out with oxalic acid and uh, calcine off to a rare earth oxide. And you have, this has been tested at infinitum, you've done this for years. We've did about four years of piloting on this flow sheet. Shall I put the flow sheet away now? Yes, thank you. So, so we've done about four years of piloting on the flow sheet, starting with about 15 to 20 tonnes of, of ore from Nolans, which we did through a uh, large diameter bore drilling. Um, we then put it through every stage of this flow sheet. We did a and, and there was about seven stages right through. Um, so we did it in various stages. We didn't go and build an integrated pilot plant. Um, there was, there was uh, no real need for that. Uh, and we took it right through to a uh, final NDPR product, uh, which we then sent off to uh, metallization partners that we're working with. Um, and they made metal out of it, NDPR metal. And then that's gone on to magnet manufacturers that we have relationships with to actually produce final permanent magnets. And uh, the metallizers and the magnet manufacturers are very happy with the product from Nolans. One of the tricky things about the rare earth elements is that you've got this, um, I, you know, when you look at the periodic table, it should be, you know, much more spread out and all that, that, that bottom, that double bar there should be kind of to the left and in between the helium and the um, hydrogen. And it's kind of the gapping over to the, to the metals. They're, 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 their physical and chemical properties are so, so close to each other that it's really hard to separate them to once you've got them into a concentrate, you know, um, and that's really been the kind of the proprietary uh, control that the Chinese have had because they've had so many metallurgists and process engineers working on it for 20 or 30 years. And from what I've, you've just described to me, it's almost as if that wasn't kind of a big intellectual leap. Well, look, there's, as, as I understand it, and, and I have to admit, I'm by no means the expert on this. I have a man with a PhD for that. Um, as I understand it, the, the, there's three main processes that people use for separating rare earth oxides. Um, the, the process that uh, was developed in, in France, um, uh, I can't for the life of me remember the company, uh, became Solve. Um, that was the nitric acid process where you, where you dissolve your rare earths up in nitric acid and then you separate it using solvent extraction. Linus, for example, as I understand it, uses the sulfate process. Both of those end up with a very, very large plant that um, you know, it costs quite a lot of money and costs quite a lot, lot of money to run. We've gone for the hydrochloric acid process. So we, we're working with a rare earth chloride. Um, and that keeps all the sizes down because we can run at much higher concentrations. Um, it's not simple. 
uh, I wouldn't have wanted to build this without piloting it. Um, but when you understand the chemistry and when you can keep the flow rates and the concentrations and, and the temperature nice and stable throughout that whole SX circuit, then, then things tend to, once they stabilise, tend to work very, very well. Um, we ran the pilot there at Ansto um, for the separation circuits, and it ran for about two weeks all up, I believe, um, and, and was producing really good quality material at the end. Um, the other part of it that's very important is precipitating out your final product. You can't afford to take any sodium, any, any chlorides, any any sulfates with it um, because you're trying to aim for a 99.5% rare earth oxide product. So, so look, it is tricky, but, you know, we're building into our design that we're doing right now um, things like we've got seven days liquor storage in front of the solvent extraction. So that means once we get it started up, once we get it stabilised, we can just keep running no matter what happens in the rest of the circuit. So there's lots of things you can do um, in the design to make these things a lot easier to run. Thank you. That's a really helpful explanation for me. Um, uh, you talked about kind of producing a metal at the end with your metal partners. Is that, um, you know, w are you just going to the the um, NDPR oxide? Is that your separated oxide product? That's your final sale product, and then need and you send it off to the manufacturers. Where are they? Um, look, we've got two metallization partners. Um, uh, in Vietnam and, um, and Thailand, and there's other metallization partners in China. I mean, China is also by far the, the largest ma permanent magnet producer in the world. So there's every chance that our product will eventually pass through China on its way. But once you go to a rare earth oxide, um, the, the, the various stages after that, the metallization, the magnet manufacturer, they're not proprietary. And, and the cost of developing those sorts of uh, processes are very reason, reasonably um, moderate, shall we say. I won't say they're small. Um, but what we're looking at doing with our sales model at the moment is really working with the end customers. So that might be a, a vehicle manufacturer in Germany or in Korea or a wind turbine manufacturer in Europe. And, and we're really looking at we will we will contract the metalizer who will make metal. The um, end user will contract the magnet manufacturer who will make the magnets for them. We will send our oxide to the metalizer. They will deliver the 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 metal to the magnet manufacturer, and then the magnet manufacturer will um, will deliver magnets to the end user. And then we'll have a an offtake arrangement with the end user, and that'll allow us to really hook into the um, export credit agencies, um, which which really are where governments start to see that there is a strategic need for this sort of uh, material to underpin you know um, the EV manufacturer in, in a lot of these places. Otherwise, I guess we'll all be driving Chinese vehicles. That's so interesting, isn't it? Yeah, because even though there's this kind of concern about supply chains and assured provenance and making sure that there's kind of Western proprietary technology over the, over the, the, the source of material and the processing material, what you've just described could easily take some steps through China. I mean, it, it, it will. Um, and, and, you know, I, th I think that... It, we, we will still have control over that product because we're at least going this far. We're not mixing our material, our oxide, or our, our, our intermediate product, our rare earth carbonate, into a chemical process that then, you know, it all comes out the other end. So our end users, and, and this is something that, you know, they've been very, very clear about with us. They demand, you know, um, ESG credentials from all their suppliers. So we're, we're working on blockchain technology. We're a member of IRMA, which is the international... Europe. Yeah, I hope the, Euro you know. the European the Euro European R raw materials alliance. I yes, think, that's like that. that's the one, yeah. um, and we're also part of UN Global Compact. So you know, we we take our sustainability very seriously, and it's a big part of what we do. And and a big part of that is because it's the right thing to do, but also our, our customers demand it. Amazing, really interesting. Um, one of the other things that you re-engineered in the update. Uh, from the feasibility study to the definitive feasibility study, was you did some geometrological mapping. Yeah, um, that's to really understand that you'd be able to control the f the the right minerals coming through over time. Was it, um, was was that 
done through those large boreholes, um, those large kind of, was that a kind of a, a separate no. exercise? No, what we did, um, and we kicked this off just before I joined and then, then I carried that through in the early stages of the DFS, was we took individual intersections from the, the drill core, knowing what the geology of those sections were, knowing what the grade of that section were, and we, we did a flotation test on it. And then we took another section and another section and another section. So we did proper variability testing. And from that, we were able to say, okay, this geology type, and we've, we've got quite a lot. Um, so, for example, the massive appetite mineralization, which we call type one and two, we know that it just floats because there's nothing else really in it. It's, it's just a bit of gang and the gang goes out the tail. The type 3B floats to a better grade, but the recovery starts to drop away because you're now starting to get some lower grade material coming into there. The type 5A, which is where you mentioned alanite before, where you're getting to the edges of the ore body or where you've got some, some alteration, so you've got some of the rare earths have been pushed across into the silicates. We needed to develop a model for that so we could understand, even though the rare earth grade might be, say, 2%, you might only be able to recover half a percent of it. So the value of that block of ore becomes less. So that, that was the big key to it. But another big key to it when we get into operation is going to be we know we need to keep the separation plant steady. So to keep the separation plant steady, let's make sure what we feed it is steady. And that works all the way back through the flotation plant and back to the blending from the mine. And, and so we're definitely going to be running and, and constantly looking at that flotation performance so we can keep the concentrate as steady and as even over short term as we can. Yeah, of course. I mean, you've got to schedule and got to blend and, and work out what your recoverable um, rare earths are. Oh, my, oh my goodness. Um, it, it ain't, it, it's no gold mine, that's for sure. No. No. <laughs> Although um, if it was a gold mine, it'd be 34 grams a tonne. Right. Okay. So those are the kind of the, um, the NSRs that you're looking at. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> good. Thank you. I understand this much better than I did when I started, which is the exercise. This is what we're trying oh, to do. That's fantastic. Um, where, where are you now in the project in terms of kind of build, um, permits, capital, you know, yep. where have you got well, to? Look one, one of the things that they did in Arafura, even before my time um, four years ago, is they, they realised that getting environmental permitting um, is, is absolutely critical. So I think it was in about 2015 they started doing the, the environmental impact assessment. Um, that ran through and the Northern Territory Government approved the EIS and gave an environmental permit in 2017. Um, being uh, that there's some, some uranium and thorium in there, we also had to get uh, federal government approval in Australia. So that happened in 2018. Um, in 2020, we negotiated our um, native title agreement with the traditional owners of the land. Um, and I think we did that in record time. It was about four months from where to go. Um, and we have signed that now, and the Northern Territory Government has granted our mineral leases. We have our operating plans that have been submitted to the government now, and we're just finalising those almost as we speak. So that's where the permitting is at. That It is literally fully permitted, um, bar a few dots and crosses and, and, and uh, detailed things. Um, on the engineering front, back in uh, uh, last year, mid last year, we raised $45 million. Um, and in uh, late August, we kicked off front-end engineering and design. Um, we're using Hatch, uh, well-known for hydrometallurgical expertise, to do the front-end engineering and design on the hydromet plant. And um, I, I guess if you've talked to a few juniors, often feed is a euphemism for, I want to keep looking like I'm doing something, but um, I just really want to redo my feasibility study. We're, we're not doing that. You know, we're actually taking the hydromet plant, which is the very big complicated bit in the middle, and we're taking that through to 60% design maturity. And the reason for that, the reason why we're, we're spending all that money kind of in front of FID is because that will allow us to go to constructors, you know, tier one constructors here in Australia and go and get lump sum prices to build it. You know, that takes all of the price risk and schedule risk and takes it away from the lenders and takes it away from Arafura. So that is the key to this thing. And for us, we're aiming for around 65% of our costs 
um, at FID to be locked in to a fixed price lump sum. Um, you know, and, I, and I think that's really important. And Gavin's spoken in the past about um, export credit agencies and kind of, um, yeah. gov- government funding, which would be unlocked at FID. Absolutely. You know, NAIF and EFA have, um, have committed to $300 million for us. Um, and that's a really good cornerstone piece of debt. And, uh, you know, so if we've got that surety of price, um, we will also bring the export credit agencies in. And with that will come the equity. Great. Um, I had meant to ask about it earlier before we got onto the money side of things, but the uranium and the thorium, what happens to that? It all ends up in the tailings dam. Okay. And, and inter- not- interestingly, and this is an interesting side effect that most people don't understand, the tailings dam is actually going to be a lower grade uh, uranium and thorium than the ore body because of um, all the ha- chemicals we precipitate. Okay. So... Um- <clears throat> How, sorry, how does that work? Because you, you're adding chemicals. We're adding a pile of reagents and chemicals, and a lot of those get precipitated out. Right. So we slightly dilute the tailings by the time we place them in the tailings dam. And, and you know, we've, we've developed the tailings dam design through the feasibility study that allows us to progressively rehab. Um, so we, we start off with two cells. Once they're full, we build another two, and we, we, we then cap off, drain, and, and then put a rock capping on um, the, the top of it. So we'll progressively rehab over our 30-year reserve or 38-year life of mine. Um, Stuart, that's fantastic. I don't know if it's your, your, your remit, um, but the, you know, it's a, it's a billion-dollar um, build, isn't it? And you've got a market cap uh, approximately, of... Approximately, yeah. Billion-dollar build, market cap of 300, 300 coming in debt. So there's a, uh, a $700 million gap Mm-hmm. Um, have you, I mean, what are the discussions around that gap? Well, look, you have to realise I am the project manager, project director. I'm, I'm not necessarily involved very closely in that. Um, certainly uh, with the funding model that Gavin, I'm sure, has gone through in the past uh, with, with, with various people, um, you know, that, that funding model really should easily bring in the debt side of things. If we can place, um, for example, you know, half our production into Germany, I think that KFW would fall over themselves uh, to, to stump up a lot of the rest of the debt um, in terms of a debt guarantee, uh, which really puts us in a very good position around the debt side of things. With offtake, um, you'll probably also find that many of the offtake partners will want to make sure this project succeeds. So they'll really, they, they will look to put in some equity protect, potentially at, at company level or, or even a project level. Um, and, and then from there on, once, once you've taken that funding and offtake risk out of the project, I think the rest of the equity um, should take care of itself with a fairly significant re-rate on the share price. Absolutely. Um, uh, as, and I'm sorry for asking a question which was not within your remit, um, and I'm sure Gavin will come back and... Um, he'll, he'll, probably, he'll probably tell me <laughs> I got it all wrong. Well, um, I, I, that's certainly going to be a kind of a key unlocking step for the, for the equity. Absolutely. Once you, you know, once, you've got, once he's got the, or him and the, the rest of the team have got the, um, the finance lined up, uh, then the project or the, the equity will um, continue along its way. Um, I'm just very grateful that I've had the opportunity to speak to you to understand the kind of the technical aspects of it. Um, thank you very much for uh, explaining it so clearly to me. Uh, is, is there anything you kind of you feel as if you want to um, that we haven't covered about the project or about the the, the build, the team, the the construction process, uh, the, the 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 path, the pipeline, the path line that uh, we haven't spoken about? Look, you know, I mean, we've got a great team here at Arafura. Um, we've been building it over the last couple of years. Um, the project team, I think, is cracking out to about 30 people now. Um, you know, we're very excited about delivering this project. Um, and, and a lot of people are joining our team and, and really, really getting involved with this project because it, it's one of those projects that really has an opportunity to, to transform Central Australia. You know, I mean, this is an intergenerational project that will deliver for that part of Australia, for the Indigenous people in that part of Australia, local businesses, um, for, the, for all of the Northern Territory. Um, and, and I think, you know, for me personally, and I, I know a lot of the guys in my team and girls, you know, that it, it's exciting to be part of something so extraordinary. And, you know, that's why we're all excited. We've got our shirts with FID 2022 on it. Um, I wouldn't wear this shirt if I didn't think we were going to do that. Great. Um, it's a big 
chemistry kit. It's a big engineering project. Um, bring it on. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it.